Okay, so let me quickly remind you of a discussion we once had. Suppose you have an orthonormal, and then we'll consider an orthogonal basis for first orthonormal, and then we'll reinterpret it as orthogonal. And we're facing the task of decomposing a vector v with respect to this either orthogonal or orthonormal basis. And just to set it up right, we'll call this basis b. And I'd like to say that we're not in any particular vector space. This could be geometric vectors, this could be polynomials, this could be audio signals, any space whatsoever. So an abstract discussion. Maybe general is a better word than abstract. We're covering all spaces at once. That's the beauty and the generality of linear algebra. Any basis, no specific choice of basis other than, let's first consider an orthonormal one, but any orthonormal basis. And any in a product. And we're facing the task, I, now I realize I shouldn't have drawn this error, of decomposing V as a linear combination of these vectors. Okay, and you remember what we did. If we didn't have an inner product at our disposal, we would just have to do whatever. We would have to, uh, for geometric vectors, draw some kind of a picture. For vectors in R3, or R3 in this case, solve a system of equations. For polynomials, we would have to do something else crafty. Maybe do it by the treasure hunt approach. Maybe by whatever maybe convert it to a system of equations. You, you would have to treat objects on their own terms, do something that's natural to those objects. But if we have an inner product at our disposal, whatever the space is, you can do this trick that I cannot even describe as fundamental. It's really in the fabric of linear algebra. It's beyond fundamental. And that is, use the dot product, the inner product. Dot both sides with one of the basis elements. Let's say we're after alpha 1. So I will dot both sides of this expression with E1. And here's what I'll have. And the beautiful part is, is that if this basis is, let's start with orthonormal. This is 0. This is 0. This is 1. And alpha 1 is simply to put it in words, to find the first coefficient in the linear decomposition. You simply have to dot the vector with E1. To find the second coefficient, you have to dot it with E2. Or to find the ith coefficient, you have to dot it with EI. How simple is that rule? To find the decomposition coefficient, simply dot the vector with the corresponding element of the basis. That's if the basis is orthonormal. Everybody remembers this, right? If it's orthogonal, so what if it's orthogonal? It's a little bit more complicated. It will be, so this is orthonormal. Orthonormal. This is my symbol for orthonormal. Orthogonal in unit length. Orthogonal. You would simply have to divide it you would still say this cancels, this cancels, but this is no longer 1. It is whatever it is. So you would have to divide by it to get the coefficient. Now the question is, what if it's neither orthogonal nor orthonormal? In your math careers, you hardly ever deal with bases that are neither orthogonal nor orthonormal neither orthonormal nor orthogonal. But it's quite possible, not quite possible, out there in the real world, the problems that we solve are not determined by your textbook, but determined by the real life problems. And so the choice of basis is dictated by the problems, by the problem, and you just have to deal with whatever basis the, your life deals you, okay? What do you do then? Does this method fall apart completely? Or is there an equivalence? Think about it for a moment. Does this idea still have legs? Or is it dead in the water? That, how, how's that for two idioms in the same question? All right, let's see what we get. So here, so 
let's proceed like we were as we were and then just see what happens because clearly what we're doing is meaningful not simple things don't work out right away but let's just see what happens so when we dot with the e1 we get what we had before right general basis looks like this kind of denoted by that symbol do any of these terms cancel no because these inner products are not necessarily zero so can we determine either alpha 1 or alpha 2 or alpha 3 from this equation? No, because we have one equation with three unknowns. Before we had the same thing but two of them dropped out so we had one equation with one unknown and we resolved it. Great. But here we can't solve it because it's one equation, three unknowns. But we can get another equation for the same three unknowns by dotting both sides of this identity with E2. And then we'll have the same three unknowns with two equations. Still no, not enough. So we'll dot it then with E3. And then we'll end up with three equations and three unknowns. And the only question will be, what is that matrix? OK, so let me write it out. So you can use your imagination of what I'm about to write. But I'll just write it out, OK? Okay, there we go. And now you say, okay, things did not work out as perfectly as before, where alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 simply presented themselves one at a time. But I can solve for them simultaneously, because I do, after all, have three equations with those three unknowns. So sometimes when you just uh, learn the subject and the, the notation throws you a little bit, you have to sort of explain things to yourself a little bit and say what we're looking at here is a lot of numbers. Like this is just a number that's characteristic of a basis. So if somebody gave me a basis, I would be able to simply figure out what this number is by dotting E1 with itself. And this is a number and this is a number. So what you see here is just nine numbers multiplying alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And the result is nine numbers. If somebody gives you the basis, and the vector to be decomposed, you can certainly dot that vector with each of the basis elements and you'll get three numbers. So what I see here is 12 numbers and three unknowns. So now let me just organize what I'm seeing into a matrix. Yes, it is matrix. We're looking at AX equals B, to put it in linear algebra lingo. That's all it is, AX equals B. So let's just write down what that AX equals B is. Okay, so my unknowns are clear. Alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. My right hand side, V dotted with E1, V dotted with E2, V dotted with E3. Okay, what goes into this matrix? The inner products. So the way I like to describe it concisely is to say pairwise products of the elements of the basis pairwise in a product of the elements of the basis. I have three elements in my basis, E1, E2, and E3. I can pair them up in nine different ways. E1, E2, excuse me, E1, 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 E2, E1, E3, E2, E1, E2, 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 E3, E3, E1, E3, E2, E3, E3, right? Nine different ways. They're all represented here. They're ask begging to be put into a matrix, okay? So this is the matrix of pairwise inner products. You cannot escape this matrix if you're working with anything having to do with inner products. I'm kind of amazed that we've avoided this matrix until now. It is of paramount importance. It's front and center. It captures everything there is to know about the inner product, as you will see in a discussion that's coming soon. Okay, is it symmetric? Yes, why is it symmetric? Because of the commutative uh, property of the inner product. Correct. 
Once you find out that a matrix is symmetric, once you find out that the matrix is symmetric, what's the next question you ask about it? Is it positive definite? Is this matrix positive definite? You don't know much. You don't know what space this is. You don't know what basis I chose. You don't know what inner product I chose. Can you still make a statement about whether or not this matrix is positive definite? If you say that it's inner product, this matrix is necessarily positive definite. That's actually exactly correct in the exact same and in the exact right reason for why it is correct. But I think it needs a little bit of elaboration, right? That's coming up shortly. Okay, so this matrix is so important, it has many names. I'll start with a name that I really like, that comes from tensor calculus, which is the metric. Uh, why it's called the metric will become apparent from that same discussion where we'll discover why it's positive definite. Uh, but it's responsible for, dis inner products are responsible for distances, right? So that's why it's called the metric, ultimately. It is also called, I won't write it down, the inner product matrix. Kind of makes sense. And it's also called the name I don't like, Graham. Okay, so, getting back to my original question, does this technique still have legs? And the answer is, well, I don't know about having legs, but it's, it will work. You're still able to do the decomposition only by evaluating in a product, and then doing nothing but arithmetic, which is Gaussian elimination or whatever it takes to solve this algebraic equation. But in the case of geometric vectors, you don't have to do any geometric constructions. You don't have to do uh, the treasure hunt. You don't have to use any of those special techniques. If you have an inner product at your disposal, you can convert this decomposition problem into this very attractive AX equals B, where the matrix A is symmetric and as we'll find out, positive definite, so you can use all sorts of ways to solve it. So yes, this technique still works if the basis is not even orthogonal. It's not nearly as nice, but it still works. 